uh, we have with us uh, Jenny Tang from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, graduated a PhD from Harvard University, and she has worked uh, quite extensively on exchange rate, in particular this issue of uh, what we are here today, this issue of the linkage between exchange rate and macroeconomic condition. Really looking forward to your presentation. Jenny, the, the floor is yours. The, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction, Nicola, and including our paper in the program. Uh, this paper is joint with Vanya Stavrakova at uh, the London Business School, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. So I will present instead. Um, and of course, the usual disclaimer applies that the views expressed in this presentation are, are my, uh, mine and Vanya's and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston or the Federal Reserve System. Okay, so in this paper, what um, we're going after or, or uh, what motivates us is uh, the fact that the current consensus in the profession still remains that the that exchange rates and macroeconomic fundamentals are quite disconnected at business cycle frequencies, meaning like monthly, quarterly, uh, such lower frequencies. And this consensus was first uh, established in the literature by Nissen Rogoff in 1983. And uh, the work uh, thereafter has still uh, yet to find a strong connection between exchange rates and macroeconomic fundamentals. Uh, instead, the recent work in this literature has shifted towards attempting to explain exchange rates using financial variables or uh, theoretically financial shocks. So you can think of these, uh, so some examples are recent works linking uh, convenience yields to um, exchange rates. So these yields are derived from uh, various uh, interest rates, or there's work also um, linking financial flows to exchange rates, such as um, the flows of uh, uh, ownership of different debt and uh, other such assets around the, the world. And instead, we're trying to revisit this exchange rate uh, disconnect debate, and again, trying to reconnect macroeconomic variables and exchange rates by using a rich data set of macroeconomic surprises, or we might also call them macro news. And uh, importantly, by allowing for econometric specifications that feature a deviation from full information, rational expectations. Um, and Secondly, we will further trace the connection that we find between macro fundamentals and exchange rates using a novel estimation of a well-known exchange rate decomposition. And importantly, our estimation will incorporate uh, survey forecast data. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but this uh, point is important to include uh, survey forecast data because of um, the uh, in the previous bullet, these uh, deviations from full information, rational expectations. So just to preview some of our main results, we will show that these high frequency macroeconomic surprises explain on average about 70% of the variation in quarterly nominal exchange rate changes. Uh, surprisingly, we find that lags macro surprises are much more important than the contemporaneous ones. And using only lagged surprises, we can explain almost all of the, um, all of this 70% of variation. Uh, macro surprises turn out to be even more important uh, for currencies of major financial centers and to be more important for all currencies during US recessions and periods of financial turmoil. Moreover, I think what surprised us the most in this project is that we find that excess returns themselves or um, currency risk premium are indeed mostly driven by macro news. Uh, and we explain just over 50% of the variation at a quarterly frequency of the uh, currency risk premium that we estimate. And uh, this um, we think is interesting because uh, it's especially this component of exchange rate, uh, exchange rate changes that um, most uh, theoretical models would uh, explain using uh, purely financial shocks. So these would be shocks to risk aversion and uh, things of such nature. But on the other hand, we find that actually in the data, over 50% of the variation can be explained by uh, surprises related to macro uh, variables. 
So this work relates to a number of literatures. So of course it relates to work um, trying to document exchange rates uh, and fundamentals being linked to at lower frequencies. And as I mentioned, most of the previous literature finds uh, weaker links than we do, uh, sometimes substantially weaker. Um, our work also relates to uh, the uh, papers that try to explain high frequency exchange rate changes using macro news. And in fact, I would say that our work bridges these, uh, uh, these two first, uh, first two literatures. Um, it also relates to work, including some of our own, that's documenting um, the importance of using survey uh, forecast data in explaining exchange rates and how this, uh, these survey forecasts tends to behave. And uh, lastly, we also show in previous work, and as do some other authors, that survey forecasts um, have a relationship with portfolio choices. So th this um, relationship is important because it tells us that these uh, professional forecasts of exchange rates, they're not just um, simply uh, forecasts made by some macroeconomists at these banks, but indeed they're actually related to trading activity. So they are, um, in a sense, the uh, re representative of forecasts that, um, that actually uh, drive financial market participants' actions. Okay, so in today's talk, I'm going to first show you the theoretical link that uh, we have in mind between macro news and exchange rates and how this relates to uh, different uh, modes of expectations formation, including deviations from fire. Then I will show you the evidence that we have on macro surprises as drivers of nominal exchange rate changes. I will then present the exchange rate decomposition that um, we compute using a survey-based VAR to then talk about uh, the different components of exchange rates that macro surprises are important for, um, which is the last one. Okay, so let's um, jump into the theoretical link. Okay, so the theoretical link is, we, we just wanna think about how macro news are transmitted to exchange rates. And so you might think of typically uh, links maybe related to uh, trade. So maybe macro news would tell you something about how imports and exports are going to evolve or how interest rates might evolve. And that would be, those are different ways that it could be related to exchange rates. To put some structure into these uh, kinds of links, we're going to use a well-known uh, exchange rate decomposition that has been used widely in previous literature. Um, so that decomposition simply expresses exchange rate changes. Now, here it can be written for any frequency, right? So we have some exchange rate change on the left-hand side, and this is going to be related to a lagged component that's composed of the lagged relative interest rate between, uh, let's say, the foreign country and U.S., and a lagged expected ex excess return. So this is the excess return that investors expected to earn as of the previous date over uh, the date uh, between dates T and T plus one. And this is the excess return from investing in the US and borrowing in foreign risk-free debt. And then you have um, a forward-looking component. And so this forward-looking component just represents the surprise in the T plus one exchange rate level itself but it can be broken down and written as the change in expectations over the uh, entire future path. Uh, so this is from uh, dates T plus one to infinity of the relative inflation rates minus the relative, uh, uh, rel uh, sorry, relative nominal interest rates, as well as the future uh, one period excess, uh, expected excess returns. And here we've, um, explicitly denoted the expectations of uh, the marginal trader uh, using this tilde, just to highlight the fact that it doesn't have to be a rational or uh, objective mathematical expectation. And so uh, this decomposition, I will go into a little bit more detail later, but I, what I will say here is that we're not really uh, using uh, very many assumptions. It's coming from just simply the definition of the expected excess return itself. And uh, later on, we'll also need, um, and I'll explain, a, an assumption that the relative real interest rate, uh, sorry, relative real exchange rate is uh, trend stationary. 
And so there's no kind of bubble term here. And so uh, we can think of the relationship between macro news and uh, exchange rate changes predominantly through this forward looking component. And uh, that is because simply because the lags component is already predetermined in the previous period. Okay, so let's consider this decomposition at a daily frequency. So let's think of these as uh, daily exchange rate changes. The existing literature has focused on the link between contemporaneous macro news and exchange rate changes at daily frequency and has found that on days with macro news releases, uh, macro surprises, so these surprises we're defining as the realization of the news minus a survey-based expectation, these are important drivers of exchange rates. So some examples of the macro news examined in previous literature and that we'll also be using in our study are things like releases of, for example, uh, the US employment report. So this is, this, um, is one report that tends to be um, across many different asset markets, one of the strongest explainers of uh, uh, movements in asset prices as far as macro news go. So this report includes, for example, the release of the US unemployment rate, and more importantly, the uh, what's called the US non-farm payroll. So this is a change in non-farm US employment in terms of uh, just number of pe uh, people, or I should say jobs actually. Um, that and it's always released the first Friday of every month and it tends to be a very important market mover. So some other examples include like uh, the trade balance, CPI, GDP, things of such nature. So these have been found to explain exchange rate changes on the day of the release um, pretty well. So bridging this to lower frequencies, uh, there is a previous paper by Altavilla, Giannone and Modugno in 2017 that have tried to translate this approach to lower frequencies by regressing daily exchange rate changes on contemporaneous news and constructing a monthly macro news index as a sum of the fitted values uh, at the daily frequency. And in doing so, they show that contemporaneous reactions to macro news actually do not explain much of the monthly exchange rate change variation. And so they argue that the disconnects at low frequency still remains. So just uh, to give you some examples, for example, they find that such news can explain, let's say between 10 and 12% of the variation at the daily frequency, but then when they take the fitted values at the daily frequency, add them up to uh, a month and then regress monthly exchange rate changes on these fitted, uh, monthly fitted values, they find that the uh, R-squares are much closer to zero. And so there's kind of uh, been difficulty in bridging these two uh, literatures. And so what is missing? And we think what is missing is that basically if you assume that uh, expectations are uh, driven by a model of full information, rational expectations, and you assume that this lags component of exchange rate changes. So the daily, so this is equivalent to the daily expected exchange rate change is that this thing is second order, then really only contemporaneous macro news should matter for exchange rate changes at the daily frequency. However, a growing literature documents that there are deviations from this full information rational expectations paradigm and survey based expectations which implies that lags macro news should also matter. Uh, some theories that, uh, some examples of such theories that feature our deviation from fire include uh, those uh, that feature dispersed or imperfect information with respect to state variables um, or learning in the, in the uh, model. So here, uh, you actually don't even need rational expectations to uh, not hold at the individual level, but even if rational expectations hold at the uh, individual level, the fact that you have imperfect information can uh, generate what looks like a deviation from rational expectations at the aggregate uh, level, meaning that um, you can predict uh, aggregate forecast errors using uh, variables that were in the uh, data, the, uh, basically aggregate um, past uh, forecast revisions or variables that are in the aggregate uh, data set, uh, information set. Uh, another um, set of models that feature deviations from fire include those where agents do not know the true uh, parameters of the data generating process. 
And so imagine you have a model where there's some, uh, maybe a true structural model with uh, structural parameters. If agents don't know those parameters, and they're either just wrong about them all the time or they learn about them slowly over time, that can uh, be another source of a deviation for fire. So there are some recent literatures, uh, uh, recent papers that use these models and there's a good review of it in this paper by Angelotos and co-authors. And we, uh, Vanya and I also have another paper that uh, features uh, one particular type of uh, deviation for fire uh, in the exchange rate uh, setting. And so these models all imply a theoretical link between lags and macro surprises and subject this uh, subjective forward-looking component of exchange rate changes. And um, so these are the kinds of links that we are going to exploit. Sorry, Jenny, can I can I ask you something? Sure. Uh, to understand really what is the function of this lag information. Mm -hmm. this lag component because you put out quite a lot of stress here so what do you mean that people is is having perfect information also about the the state now or form the expectation on the basis of imperfect information about the actual so why the the lag the information will have this uh, this importance Sure. Yeah. Okay. Not well known or yeah. Yeah. So I think I don't know in, if I'm clear. Yeah. in our current paper, um, we can't really the, the data that we have is unable to disentangle between um, theories, but I think I can give you some more concrete examples if that's helpful. And so some examples that um, we have in mind uh, are, for example, talked about in um, a paper by Chin. Um, where he uh, did a survey of uh, actual uh, participants in exchange rate markets. And so there um, he finds that these participants, like they, uh, these market participants, they say that essentially context can be important. And so you might get, for example, a release of let's say the latest GDP numbers. And you might react a little bit to that on the day of the news, but in the days following the news, uh, participants, market participants may continue to react. So some of this is, may just be slow processing of the news. Um, so one example that is not really related to macro surprises, but for example, this news um, that came out on Friday of the WHO declaring that this new Omicron um, COVID variant is a variant of concern. There was a big uh, you know, market reaction on Friday and now you're seeing some um, pullback of that reaction as people start to realize, oh, well, you know, the scientists don't actually know how serious this uh, variance is. And so you saw kind of an overshoot that's now coming back uh, in the days following. This can happen with macro news as well. Um, and it can even happen a few months after the fact as people start to learn how important that piece of news was. So this might this kind of story would fall into a case where maybe agents do not know the true parameters of the data generating process. They don't know how persistent shocks really are. It can also fall into the category of uh, this um, these models with imperfect information. If you think that there are shocks in the model that are transitory and then there are shocks that are more persistent. And at first, when you just see what the new GDP number is, and uh, there's a surprise there, you don't know how persistent that surprise is. Is it a more kind of permanent shock or is it a more temporary shock? And this is something you might learn over time um, as you see other information coming in. And so these are all things that can generate a, slow, a slower reaction to news that's not just um, a full reaction on the day of the news. Does that Thank answer? you. Very clear. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Very clear. Thank you. Sure. Great. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what we can see in the data a little bit later in terms of how these responses look dynamically over time. Okay. And so the idea in this paper is to use these macro surprises to still uh, see how, how well they explain nominal exchange rate changes, but importantly, to kind of let go of this um, uh, assumption of full information rational expectations and see if by using lags macro surprises, we can do a little bit better. Okay, so to do this, we're still going to build on this two step procedure that I described that we use in this paper by Altavia and uh, Genone and Modugno. 
But instead of using just the contemporaneous news on the day of the exchange rate change, we're going to also allow uh, lag news in there. And so the first step of our procedure is to construct a daily news index by regressing uh, daily exchange rate changes on uh, macro surprises. And so here I have um, capital K number of macro surprises and we're allowing up to 126 um, daily lag. So why 126? This is approximately six months worth of trading days. So if you count only trading days, one month has approximately 21 days. Um, however, we can't uh, estimate this thing using all 126 lags for all the surprises that we have just because of uh, data constraints. We just don't have, uh, eventually we run out of, um, of observations to uh, estimate all of these different uh, beta parameters. So instead we're going to impose a little bit of structure by imposing essentially a stepwise response of exchange rates to each macro surprise that's going to be summarized by 10 coefficients. So for the first um, uh, four days, so contemporaneous plus three lags, we allow those uh, coefficients to be estimated flexibly without any further constraints. Beyond that, uh, so we're going to constrain the coefficients to be the same across uh, lagged months. So there's going to be one coefficient for all the surprises, um, all the lags between uh, lag four and 21. So that's about one, uh, one month uh, worth of lags. And then the same for lags 22 through 42 and so on. So this imposes kind of a stepwise response of exchange rates to each macro surprise. What that does is that it allows us to have only 10 coefficients per surprise instead of 127 coefficients. So it reduces the dimensionality of the problem uh, greatly. Then we're going to take this um, daily uh, fitted value and we're going to sum them up within calendar quarters to arrive at essentially one series of uh, what we're going to call a quarterly now uh, macro news index. And now we're going to regress quarterly exchange rate changes on this uh, quarterly macro in, uh, news index. And we're going to mainly be interested in the um, adjusted R squared of the second stage uh, regression. The surprises that we're going to use will be surprises on uh, different measures of economic activity. So this might include labor market measures. Um, it can also include, of course, uh, GDP measures, industrial production measures. Um, it can also include survey measures. So things like business confidence uh, and consumer confidence. Uh, we're also going to use data releases on inflation, which can include various different types of inflation uh, indicators, trade, of course. Um, and sorry, I misspoke. So the, the labor market indicators were, um, were also including um, as well separately and the uh, monetary policy indicators as well. So these are surprises mainly on uh, indicators of monetary policy uh, stance. So interest rates or um, in the case of some countries, we also have uh, money, money supply and things like that. Uh, the surprises will be the actual value of the release minus the forecast. And we have two different data sources for forecasts. Uh, we get them either from Bloomberg or uh, from a survey run by a company called Informa Global Markets. And these forecasts are recorded at most a week before the data release. So they're fairly high frequency um, surprises. The sample that we'll use starts uh, towards the end of 2001 and ends in 2015. Uh, quarter three. So this uh, first table just shows you what our daily regressions look like. So of course I can't show you the, the hundreds of, um, of uh, coefficients that we have, but what I can show you is the number of surprises that we have for each uh, currency pair. And so for each currency pair, we're going to include the surprises for that particular country. So for example, for Australia, we have 10 surprises and we're also going to include 13 surprises for uh, coming from the US. And so in total for, for example, for Australia, we'll have 23 surprises um, and uh, 10 coefficients for each of those. Then we have also the first stage uh, R squareds, uh, for, sorry, the R squareds for this first step regression. And here I'm showing you the unadjusted R squareds. 
And so even unadjusted using a couple of hundred uh, different uh, variables, and, uh, sorry, a couple of uh, hundred uh, different coefficients, we show that um, macro surprises, they do matter at the daily uh, frequency, but they only explain about up to about 12% of the variation, right? So we're not explaining, it's not that we're explaining the whole uh, daily exchange rate change, but rather we're explaining up to about 12%, which is pretty decent for the daily uh, frequency. Interrupt uh, again, uh, one question. <clears throat> Are not these, uh, I was looking at the number of surprises. Yeah why are not i'm not sure if there are uh, a small amount of which i uh, why so few surprises if these one are sort of uh, is surprises of an, an indicator if i understand correctly is uh, you know mm -hmm. therefore there is so few surprises on those monetary policy or in all this country for a period quite that is quite long Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> these are not observations of surprises. Um, these ah. are variables. So, so these are ten different, let's say, indicators. Ah, echo. Eh? All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ten different indicators. Okay, for, for each country. Australia, okay. okay. Right. We don't, all right. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Them. We, I've, we, yeah. have, we've had this confusion in the past in previous um, <laughs> talks, so I should explain this better. But yeah, yeah, no, so, yeah, just so the number of surprises that was a bit okay. No, no, no yeah, you no. they're very good uh, for the casting. <laughs> <the top. laughs> no, 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 not at all. They're they're not good at all, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, yeah, so basically every month, you know, some of these. So for the U.S., uh, we have one that's even weekly, um, okay, for, exactly, yeah. in terms of unemployment claims. But these are these are variables. And so, for example, for let's say the you know the Swiss franc, we would have 20. So seven plus 13 from the U.S. 20 variables that are surprises. And for these 20, we're actually including all 126 lags of them, right? So Perfect. this is why we couldn't estimate all of the lags um, coefficients yeah, yeah. because you quickly run out of observations. Um, but Wonderful. we estimate 10 coefficients for each of these 20 surprises, and we get 200 coefficients actually. Um, and so, so even with all of these 20 uh, variables and you know 126 lags of them, we're explaining up to, in the case of the Sister Frank, 11% uh, uh, of the daily variation. Then we take this thing, this uh, regression, we take the fitted value, we add up the fitted values, we just sum them across the uh, quarter. And um, Maybe I should explain this because we've had questions about this before too, but the, the reason we're just summing them over the quarter is because if you sum all of the uh, actual, the true daily exchange rate changes over the quarter, you get the one quarter exchange rate change, right? So it makes sense to sum the fitted value of the daily exchange rate change too. Um, so then once we do that and we create this quarterly exchange rate means index, when we regress the actual one quarter exchange rate change on this macro news index, that's just the fitted value from this regression. So it's it's just a function of these, um, it's just a linear combination of these macro surprises and their lags. You see that we now uh, can explain a large majority of the variation uh, in a panel regression across all of these uh, different uh, advanced economy exchange rates, we explain almost 70%, right? So this is the number I quoted earlier. And if you look at um, the cross-sectional variation, you see that it's actually the uh, financial centers that uh, have a, a larger adjusted R squared. So this was franc, the euro, the pound, and the yen are the examples that we have. These um, uh, different currencies have uh, higher R squared at the quarterly frequency um, than the other currencies that are uh, not known to be financial centers. If you then split the sample by uh, periods that are US recessions versus not recessions, and here because of our sample, it's, it's primarily the uh, financial crisis versus other periods and periods where the VIX is high versus low. So we just, uh, um, for what, uh, this regression here, we just split the sample half and half by the median uh, value of the VIX. You see that during times of, uh, basically during the US uh, financial crisis and uh, the uh, periods where the VIX is above its median, you get higher R squareds than other times. So these uh, this macro news index tends to explain more variation in exchange rate uh, changes 
uh, during these times of basically economic or financial turmoil. Uh, because of how our macro news index is calculated, it's just a fitted value, we can actually split that up, right? So taking the same exact regression, we're not re-estimating it. We can take the part of the fitted value that's coming from the inflation indicators. We can take the part that's coming from the activity indicators, the trade variables that I'm calling this external contribution or the monetary variables. And we see that it's the activity news that tends to be most important for explaining variation in uh, exchange rate changes. So these numbers are all uh, what's called partial R squared. So this is uh, basically the increase in the R squared from including this uh, activity indicator subcomponents. So basically, if you include only inflation, uh, the trade components and the monetary component, you would have in the panel regression an adjusted R squared that's 53% lower than if you also included the activity components. We also find that um, the uh, US and foreign surprises tend to be similarly important. So it's not that US news is dominating all of the exchange rate uh, movements, but the uh, maybe I should instead call this the local component. So for example, the Australian news still has a partial R squared of 59% in explaining um, uh, exchange rate, uh, the uh, exchange rate changes in the Australian dollar. What you see also is that both across these kind of what you might call subjects or concept sub indices and the US and local news sub index, that if you add these up, they're adding up to more than just um, the uh, R squared from including all of this sub indices. And this shows that there is some uh, correlation across different indicators of, uh, in terms of the uh, surprises. If they were all uncorrelated, these would add up perfectly. And uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. So more importantly for our story though, we can also break down this macro news index by uh, basically by the timing. Right, so we can take the fitted value and we can group together only the contemporaneous observations. And here I'm being a little bit generous. So by contemporaneous, I'm actually including the actual contemporaneous, so same day plus uh, the one, two, and three day lags. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of generous uh, definition of, of contemporaneous. And the reason we're doing this is to uh, consider the fact that some of the news happens, uh, for example, some of the news happening coming out of Japan or Australia is actually happening still on a weekend in US markets. So maybe not all the traders are responding really on the same day to that news. Um, but we're calling this, um, we have this slightly expanded definition of contemporaneous in this table. And then I can group together um, all the observations that are from the first lag uh, for, or first month lag, second month lag, and so on. And so again, these are partial R squares. And uh, the first thing uh, you see is that again, it, the uh, R squares are not perfectly adding up to uh, the, the R squared of including all of the uh, sub indices together. Uh, it's getting a little bit closer, but they're still not, not adding up perfectly. So there's still some correlation even over time in these surprises. Uh, and this is another like a hint that there's some deviation from full information of rational expectations. And uh, most importantly though, you see that these uh, longer lags still are quite important in explaining uh, these um, quarterly exchange rate changes. And so these are actually a crucial uh, component of their explanatory power. So if you can include only the so-called uh, this expanded definition of contemporaneous sub-index, then this is what I'm uh, that what I was uh, mentioning before about the result from the Alta Villa Genone Moldunia paper. This it's not quite the exercise they have, but it's similar in spirit. So if you include only the contemporaneous uh, macro news in formulating your index, you explain much closer to zero of the variation in uh, quarterly exchange rate changes. Instead, it's quite important to include more lags. And what we see here by breaking down the lags uh, across all the months is even the six month lag news. So this is news six months ago explaining the current quarters exchange rate variation. So it's a lag that's outside of the current quarter even. 
you can add uh, in a panel 21% uh, to the uh, adjusted R squared by including that lag. Uh, that, um, sorry, so including the part of the fitted value that's constructed from um, uh, surprises six months ago. And in the next table, I'll show you the explanatory power that we have for not the entire exchange rate change, but the component that's coming only from the exchange rate surprise. So in this particular exercise, all I did was I took just directly professional forecasts coming from a survey. So here we're using uh, consensus economics, um, their survey, and this is the median. So the consensus forecast of the exchange rate uh, three months uh, from today. And I'm taking the surprise from that forecast and I'm regressing that on our macro news uh, uh, indices and in particular breaking it down into these different labs. And so this is the purely just the surprise component. We see the same patterns. So the importance of the longer lasting dynamics uh, extends to the survey based measure of just the forward looking component of uh, quarterly exchange rate changes. So if full information rational expectations held, we should see that at least lags four, five, and six, so these are the lags outside of the current quarter, these should be zeros, and they're not. And um, it's, uh, they're arguably just as important as the, um, the part of the macro news that actually occurred within the same quarter. And so this is uh, the most direct evidence um, that I'll be showing you today of a deviation from full information, rational expectations. So why are these lags so important? So here I'm going to give you a little bit more graphically um, why the uh, evidence of why these lags are so important. So to gain some intuition for this, we're going to estimate Jordan uh, Jorda projection in post responses, where now we're going to estimate the exchange rate change between the day before the news, so this T sub D minus one to some uh, horizon uh, H days ahead on the news that occurred on that day. By doing so, we're implicitly assuming that the surprises are IID over time, which I showed earlier is not a perfect assumption, but it's maybe kind of close. And so we can then plot these the sums of these coefficients over time um, sorry, just these coefficients over time are related to the sums of the coefficients from our uh, first stage regressions over time. Basically, when we look at these impulse responses, if it's only the contemporaneous response that matters, you should see an impulse response where the exchange rate either jumps up or down on the day of the news, and then it should be flat thereafter. Essentially, all the reaction to that uh, news should happen on the day of the news only. And these are the impulse responses that we estimate. And we see that that's clearly not the case. In uh, most of these cases, you see that the reaction on the day of the news is actually pretty small. And so for example, in the case of this is, these are, uh, these are graphs for the pound dollar exchange rate and these are UK surprises. So in response to a positive surprise in the UK inflation, CPI inflation rate, the exchange rate responds a tiny bit on the day of the news, but then the response uh, tends to grow larger over time. Um, and we're showing this for up to the 126 day horizon that we're considering. Similarly for GDP news, there's a small negative reaction on the day of the news that grows over time. You see uh, with respect to some indicators such as the uh, production one, so industrial production here, manufacturing production more specifically here, the reaction actually tends to flip um, to be of an opposite sign once you get out uh, four or five, six months after the, the news has come out. And so uh, this is more kind of graphical evidence that the response to these news, they're uh, not all happening just on the day of the news. There's actually interesting dynamics that um, after uh, even several months after the news that uh, we show to be important for uh, exchange rate movements. Okay, so the importance of this lack, uh, news on exchange rates, it's not only for exchange rates, right? You see this in other markets as well. So it's consistent with the literature on, uh, for example, in bond markets, the post monetary policy announcement drift, and in equity markets, the post earnings announcement drift. 
So it's um, uh, maybe a more pervasive uh, phenomenon that goes uh, beyond exchange rate markets as well. We do some robustness checks as well. We try to estimate uh, using Bayesian methods our first stage regression. So instead of imposing a stepwise shape in the uh, response to these surprises, we actually estimate coefficients for all 126 lags of each of these you know, 20, 30 uh, surprise variables by uh, basically imposing now a Bayesian structure on the coefficients to allow us to estimate this many coefficients. When we do it that way instead, we get second stage R squared still of about uh, 55%. We also do a robustness check where we just take the estimated um, impulse responses that I showed a couple of slides ago, and we construct fitted values using those estimates. So those fitted values, we are assuming that the surprises are IID over time. That's the drawback, but it is allowing us flexibility to estimate uh, the entire response flexibly instead of imposing that, it's, that it looks stepwise. When we do that, uh, the second stage R squared that we find is 47%, so still close to half, exchange, uh, explaining close to half of uh, the quarterly exchange rate change variation. Uh, when we allow um, interactions in that, um, in the, the estimated impulse responses, essentially just allowing the impulse responses to look different during times of high or low VIX or uh, during times of um, recessions or not. In the uh, high or low VIX interaction, we explain now, uh, 57% in the second stage. So these um, are a little bit lower than our baseline estimates, but it's maybe not surprising because we're using essentially the same data to estimate what's now two to 3,000, sometimes more coefficients in the first stage instead of just estimating a couple of hundred coefficients. So we're losing a lot of efficiency in our estimation there, and that's resulting in a little bit um, worst performance in the second stage. But these robustness checks show that um, we're still uh, generally able to explain a, a close to a majority of the variation in uh, exchange, rate change for, uh, exchange rate changes at the quarterly frequency. Okay, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we use the exchange rate decomposition to pin down which aspect of exchange rate changes um, is really uh, being explained by macro surprises, but maybe it's a good time to pause if, to see if there are more questions. Yes, so there is one question from Ekaterina and she says, how could the importance of 6M rather far in the past contribution be explained? Can lagged news be really seen as news? Um, yeah, so I think this picture uh, is a good, just visual example of why the lag news matter. And it's because you see, for example, that, so for example, in the case of like these uh, production indicators, the response to the, uh, the new news about industrial or manufacturing production actually flip and it takes a while for them to flip. So, so this is systematically estimated over our entire sample. Uh, on the day of the news and up to, let's say, about a 70-day lag, which is a little bit over three months uh, in terms of trading days, the reaction is uh, negative with respect to this manufacturing production surprise. And after that, it flips to positive, right? So what this is saying that is that systematically, uh, exchange rates tend to be correlated in a different direction with these surprises in months, uh, lags, uh, four, five, and six months out. And so, uh, and similarly, you see, so not a flip, but you see that the reaction to, for example, GDP surprises grows tremendously over time. Uh, so that, uh, you know, lags four, five, and six out, the reaction has grown to be several times larger than the, the you know, the reaction on the day of the news. And so, these are the same kind of stories I told earlier. The market just tends to maybe, for example, for in the case of GDP, they're learning over time that these uh, surprises actually are indicating more uh, persistent or maybe even permanent shocks as opposed to uh, transitory. And so they're uh, reacting more to them over time. And um, so I think that's what's happening. Can I ask you something? 
yeah. are the news somehow correlated to each other in the sense that is a flow of news is not yeah. a, and it's not an independent therefore i make a mistake on gdp and then the next uh, gdp will confirm the direction of my mistake therefore i am adjusting because the news are also correlated to each other so yeah. that i can explain this long uh, adjustment process because I'm, I'm updating essentially on the same news uh, that is uh, replicated over and over yeah, I think there is a bit of that happening, and um, you see that here, since these partial R squares are adding up, in general, they're adding up to a little bit more than uh, the uh, R squared you get by just including all of them at the same time. Uh, the fact that, that they're adding up to more, I think, indicates that, that they are somewhat positively correlated. Uh, they're not adding up to a lot more, so the correlations are not super strong, but they are positively correlated. We haven't looked to see if the surprises in you know each of these underlying uh, indicators are positively correlated over time. That is something we can do, um, and so. But I think the the indication from this table is that they are, um, and so that that can be part of the story that you that the uh, these financial market participants are actually just being surprised kind of in the same direction over time. And that is totally consistent with some of these theories that I uh, reviewed earlier that you're either learning slowly over time that a shock is more persistent than uh, you thought it was going to be, or you're learning over time that there are certain um, structural parameters of the model are different than what you think they are. And your, your estimates are kind of converging over time to the true ones. Um, and so that that uh, any of those stories could be consistent with these patterns. And that's why I'm saying that the data and the evidence that we have in this project can't really tell apart the different uh, theories. What it can tell you is that the theory that a full information rational expectations is wrong, but how you deviate from it, um, we, we, do, we don't know in this uh, particular paper. And it's, a, it's a, a topic of our future research. So now that we see that it is ex explaining some exchange rate variation at the quarterly uh, frequency, let's try to understand what aspects of exchange rate changes. So we're going to use, again, this uh, present value decomposition that I showed earlier. And now I'm just putting a little bit more uh, detail into it. So essentially, all we're doing is we're defining expected excess returns from investing in the dollar and shorting the foreign currency. That's it. We're not you know, making any assumptions about what this thing has to look like, if it's consistent with any model of risk premium, nothing like that. It's just a definition. And then using this definition, we can express the exchange rate change in levels and iterate it forward. Here, we are making an assumption of the law of iterated expectations. So that puts a little bit of structure on the uh, expectations um, themselves to write down this um, iteration. And then, Taking that uh, expression in levels, we just take a first difference. Now it's at a quarterly frequency to get um, this expression again. And it's the same expression I showed earlier, where now I'm just using symbols instead uh, to break down the different components. So here's your purely forward-looking component of exchange rates changes that's coming from the uh, T to T plus one surprise in the exchange rate level. And this can be written as the change in the expectations over the path of future relative nominal interest rates, future exchange uh, excess returns, and um, a component that is the uh, change in the expectation over the long run value of the nominal exchange rates. And now if we simply assume that there is no change in expectation over the long run value of the real exchange rate, so trend stationary would fulfill this um, assumption, then you can write this term as the change in expectations over the entire future path of relative inflation rates. And so now we want to estimate each of these terms. And you see there's a lot of expectations in these terms. And to do so, we need to get estimates of all these ex expectations. We have uh, survey estimates uh, of uh, professional forecasters for some of these horizons, but not all, right? So we need to fill in all the other horizons. Existing papers use expectations implied by um, VARs, 
And so this actually embeds some fire consistent behavior into the estimated components, because as an econometrician, you're ex post estimating this VAR. And uh, so already you're having more information than people did at the time in terms of estimating the parameters. And moreover, by estimating the VAR in this way, you're, you obtain by definition uh, residuals so surprises uh, that are uh, not correlated with the uh, lag variables in the VAR. So there, it's somewhat fire consistent already. So you're kind of biasing the answer a little bit. These VARs tend to produce unrealistic expectations because of small sample bias, for example. So our solution instead is to borrow from the uh, term structure literature um, by estimating the VAR coefficients with an additional goal of matching survey data. And uh, so this you can think of as a structured way to interpolate or extrapolate from uh, the professional forecast that we already have in some horizons to other horizons. So I'll just show you the, um, oh, sorry. First for the data, we're using the same 10 advanced economies, a slightly longer sample going back to 1990. The variables that we'll include in our VAR include the real exchange rate level, the CPI inflation rates of both uh, the local uh, economy and the US, GDP gaps, uh, and the current account to GDP ratios, three month fail rates, the yield curve slope and curvature. Again, all of these are for the local um, country and the US. And we're also on top of that going to include the US uh, VIX and TED spread. We're going to use this VAR to match survey data from the blue chip and consensus economics on the variables that mainly we have in our decomposition. So interest rates, inflation, and exchange rates. So we're going to use basically as much data as we have from these sources. And so we have a VAR. We use two lags quarterly. We do impose some zero restrictions in these coefficients just to basically reduce the dimensionality of this VAR because it is quite large. We have a lot of variables and we include variables for both countries. So we assume that the US is large and is not affected by other countries, but that conditions in the US can spill over into the macro economies of other countries. And we assume that the real exchange rate lags enter only into its own equation. So this next slide is uh, more important. So how are we using survey data in the VAR? We're not adding the survey data as additional VAR variables. What we're doing is we write down a set of equations that map our VAR forecast. So this expression is forecast implied by our VAR. And on the left-hand side, we have the survey forecast. And so we estimate the VAR coefficients to minimize both the one quarter head standard VAR errors. So that part's, you know, OLS would minimize those errors, but we also want to minimize the errors in fitting forecast uh, data. And so by doing so, we end up with uh, expectations at all different horizons that are more consistent with uh, uh, professional forecasts. And so we have some pictures of what these look like. And uh, the blue and uh, line is our survey-based VAR forecast. And the red line is our VAR estimated without using this extra set of uh, uh, equations. So it's just OLS essentially. And the blue, uh, sorry, the black and the gray lines are uh, survey uh, professional forecasts. And so here you see that for shorter horizons, so this is three month interest rates, inflation rates, they're not too different. Um, the survey-based VR, of course, fits better. It's the long horizons where this starts to matter. So this is a uh, six to 10 year out uh, estimates of the uh, three month interest rates. Uh, we also have the uh, CPI inflation right now I'm adding to the bottom. And it's here where without the surveys, if you're just doing an OLS VAR, the red line is way too flat. Um, it's way too low for most of the sample, but once you ask the estimation to also fit the survey forecast, even though the VAR itself has not changed the same set of variables, you do a lot better in fitting the surveys. And so that's what we gain from uh, using the survey data. Even exchange rate uh, professional forecasts, you can fit quite well with a fairly standard VAR, 
as long as you're choosing coefficients that match uh, survey forecasts. Okay, and so using that, we can now um, do a couple of exercises. I'm not going to spend too much time here. What I'm showing here is basically the, what we can say is that the variance of the quarterly exchange rate change is um, pretty much completely uh, swamped by the variation of the forward looking components. And that itself is pretty much swamped by the variation of the uh, exchange, uh, the excess returns components. So it, it is still excess returns that drive exchange rate changes predominantly. What the point we're trying to make is that these excess returns, they're not just financial variables or driven by financial shocks. They're still very much linked to um, macro surprises. That's what we're trying to going to see in the next uh, couple of slides. So then we take those subcomponents and we do the same exercise I showed earlier. Instead of only using one exchange rate news index now, we construct in the first stage additional exchange rate news, uh, sorry, additional macro news indices using daily changes in short rates, the yield uh, curve slope and curvature variables. Because these, simply because these are important for explaining primarily the exchange rate components that reflect interest rate and inflation expectations. Again, in the first stage, we're not kind of explaining a, a ton of variation in these variables at the daily frequency. But then when we move to the quarterly frequency, we see that even for the line I want you to focus on, um, since I am short on time now, the, is the uh, excess returns component. This is the component that people think of as risk premia. It's driven by shocks to risk aversion or shocks to the balance sheet of large banks. What we're showing here is that these macro news indices that we construct as fitted values of macro surprises in a panel of advanced economies can explain over 50% of the variation in this variable that people think of as being purely uh, driven by financial shocks. So the um, main takeaway from our work here is that theories of exchange rate must include a channel that connects macro uh, information to uh, particularly uh, exchange rates through expected excess returns through these risk premium. So that's very important. And even for now I'm using our estimated components, you see that even for excess returns, these lagged uh, surprises are tremendously important. They're just as important as the more important than the, just the contemporaneous and just as important as the lives within the same quarter. And again, we see a greater importance during of macro news during times of economic or financial turmoil. And so just to conclude in this paper, we're using high frequency macro surprises along with a novel survey based exchange rate decomposition to document that these macro surprises drive a large majority of quarterly exchange rate change variation most surprisingly, a majority of the variation in uh, excess returns. And so these new facts support theories that link macro variables to exchange rates through excess returns, and particularly theories that allow for a deviation from full information rational expectations. And so I'm sorry for going a couple of minutes over time. Thank you very much for listening. And for those who have the time to stay on, I'm very happy to answer more questions. It was a great pleasure, a great pleasure, very, very interesting. If, if I if I can start while the other are thinking what to ask, I, I found it is very interesting because it give a sort of path, if I understand, then I want you to confirm, a path to try and understand, uh, a path to try and understand the, the risk premium, as you said at the end, in the sense that, yeah, we cannot find a direct connection in the model that we have between movement of exchange rate, even a medium, at, at the, a, a sort of uh, at the monetary policy uh, horizon. Eh? At the monetary policy horizon, we find very difficult to find this connection, and therefore we move towards this sort of financial analysis. So we had papers before uh, before you that you know would try uh, looking at this uh, at this. But the way the way I see uh, or if I'm correct, what the way you interpret it is essentially risk premium is uh, an indication of uncertainty or difficulty of predicting the macroeconomic evolution for we and 
the uncertainty, or if you want a systemic uncertainty or night and uncertainty about the underlying structure, therefore any new piece of information is used to infer possible, but is an, an, an imperfect inference. Therefore, it's not a, an immediate adjustment, but it's an imperfect inference. And why there is the distance between what the expectation and the information that are coming out, the wider will be the risk premium, if you want. Is that a sort of an acceptable interpretation of the work uh, or in which direction this can be interpreted? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's um, again, so in this um, paper, we kind of stayed away from imposing a lot of theoretical structure because we just wanted to put the facts out there. But um, I think you can go beyond this and then put in an actual model, a structural model of your risk premium. And then, uh, so if you have a model or theory that's based on uncertainty, you can then see, so, you can like take our estimates of the excess returns, take the part that's related to uncertainty, and then see if that part, that like kind of um, uh, sub part of the excess returns is still indeed uh, mainly explained by uh, these macro surprises. My hunch is yes, without the evidence, I can't say it for sure, but my, I suspect that that is the case. You can think of some other, uh, even just like very standard kind of like, um, let's say CAPM based models where the, uh, the so-called stochastic discount factor of traders might be related to just um, their growth expectations and things like that. So the risk premium uh, of traders might be related to growth expectations. That's another very direct way to see why, you know, <laughs> that why these macro news must be related to, to risk premium. I think that for a long time, the, uh, uh, the finance literature has thought of uh, risk premia as just being kind of falling from the sky, just driven by these ex yeah. uh, exogenous shocks. And I think this paper is just adding another piece to uh, uh, to nudge that literature in a direction of considering these risk premia more, more endogenously and not just endogenously, but also actually related to uh, macro variables. A bit against this interpretation, do you find variation across countries? Therefore, or is clear the fundamental structure is the same? Yeah, so let's see. So, a little bit of variation across countries. And again, I think it's for the financial centers where um, you see the risk premia of those currencies being uh, more explained by uh, macro news. I would urge a little bit of caution here though, because this exercise was done using the uh, macro surprises of the, uh, the local country and the US, right? So for the financial centers, you have the news of each of these countries and the US. So the, the underlying, uh, the heterogeneity across currencies is not driven um, by just heterogeneity and how these currencies are uh, reacting to the same set of news. It's actually a different set of news we're using. And so what we're thinking going forward is if we think this heterogeneity could be interesting, but what we want to do is to use a uniform set of news. Let's say if we use only the US news or something like that for each um, currency and then uh, look at the heterogeneity there. And so because we suspect that it's certainly possible that the uh, financial centers have higher R squares because it's the news of the financial centers that matter. So if we put, let's say Euro news into the uh, Australian dollar uh, currency regressions, we may get a higher R squared too because there are a lot of important financial actors in Europe, for example. So I think before we really interpret the cross-sectional heterogeneity, we have to first hold constant the set of news for each currency, but that is something that we're planning to do uh, next. Yes, because yeah, it, uh, because yeah, obviously so from, the, from the point of view of emerging countries, there is this element of how much is all driven by U US news or, yeah, or you know yeah. global financial cycle and how much the local macroeconomic the news matters for that. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I'm. I don't have it broken down into um, uh, just the currency risk premium, but here you can see like um, 
here it is uh, just the US contribution. And you do see that it's actually not, I don't know if opposite is the right word, but like if you do see that for some of these currencies that are not financial centers, they tend to be maybe more commodity currencies. If the US news actually matters less. And here it might be because they are commodity currencies it's the commodity news that matters more. Uh, it would be, I, I too am curious as to what this looks like for more emerging markets. We haven't done that yet in this paper because we don't have enough data to do the second part of the estimation uh, in terms of decomposing the exchange rate for uh, emerging markets, but we can do the first part of the estimation for emerging markets. So that, that is something, that's a good suggestion. That, that's something we might be able to add. Oh, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question, anybody? Yeah, Ekaterina, right, you go for it. Hello. Uh, Jenny, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting presentation. I have a technical question. Um, could you please uh, maybe explain once again this step of going from the daily frequency into the quarterly frequency? How does this aggregation um, happen? Thank you. Um, yeah. Sure, so it's it's really simple. It's just, uh, we take all the days within the quarter, the fitted value on those days, and we just add them. And the reason that it's okay to do that and the reason we think it makes sense is because these daily uh, fitted values, they're fitted values of the one day change in the exchange rate, right? So then to go to the quarterly frequency, if you add up all the one day changes over the exchange rate in a quarter, you get the, change between the end of the previous quarter and the end of the current quarter. And that's the quarterly exchange rate change that uh, is on the left-hand side. That's the one we're interested in uh, anyway, these end of quarter uh, based uh, changes. And so that's why we just add up all of the um, daily uh, fitted values. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, and then for macro variables or mm -hmm. announcements, uh, do you aggregate it the same way? So, mm -hmm. yeah, so we actually don't need to aggregate the macro surprises, right? So we do a regression on the macro surprises at the daily frequency. And so this, this all happens at the daily frequency. These are daily macro surprises and daily exchange changes. Then we take the fitted value, right? So, so in that way, by taking the fitted value, you're already kind of aggregating the macro surprises not over time, but cross-sectionally. And then you have one daily uh, fitted value of daily exchange rate changes. And that's the one thing we're aggregating over time. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jenny, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been very, very interesting. Very interesting. We will be in contact again because we are very, very, keen on this research is really very interesting and we are really looking forward to see more of more of this and uh, th thank you for coming for coming although virtually we would have, have rather have you <laughs> visiting us a bit longer no. yeah one day one day as soon as the world reopen uh, no. we'll try we'll try to bring everybody here maybe on the same room and we'll have a better a better experience but really thank you very much jenny and uh, yeah thank you for yeah, including thank you, me. thank you for the great questions thank you thank you very much thank you